thank you, Ren, for a real treat this evening. And our programs are always diverse. We're very happy to have you. And I should have told you in the beginning, I'm Barbara Ballard, I'm the Associate Director here. And at that, I will introduce to you those who don't know and just bring him out to introduce Richard Epstein, Bill Lacey, Director of the Dole Institute of Politics. Thank you very much. Uh, we're delighted to have all of you this evening uh, with us. Uh, Richard A. Epstein is the James Parker Hall Distinguished Servants Professor of Law at the University of Chicago, where he's taught since 1972. He has also been the Peter and Kirsten Bedford Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution since 2000. Prior to joining the University of Chicago Law School faculty, he taught law at the University of Southern California from 1968 to 1972. He served as interim dean from February to June 2001. At present, Richard is the director of the John M. Olin Program in Law and Economics. He's published a number of important books, the most recent being How Progressives Rewrote the Constitutions. One of his principal arguments in this 2006 volume is that progressives through history, quote, saw in constitutional interpretation the opportunity to rewrite a constitution that showed at every turn the influence of John Locke and James Madison into a different constitution, which reflected the wisdom of the leading intellectual reformers of their own time. One reviewer of this book offered the following. Epstein is one of America's most brilliant scholars. He speaks off the cuff in rapid fire fashion, not just in complete sentences or paragraphs, but in complete chapters, marshalling facts and theories and handling objections, not straw men, but the most intellectually respectable versions of objections, before many of his listeners have absorbed what he said, let alone formulated questions. So two things for you to do tonight. First, think fast. Secondly, welcome Professor Epstein to the Dole Institute of Politics. try and speak as slowly and clearly as possible. Um, actually, I, every time I have spoken in front of a public audience, I always make that particular vow, and it turns out within a matter of 30 seconds I have quickly forgotten it. So I will try to make that New Year's resolution again, but I understand that it always fails, so I hope you will have some patience with my speed and will be attentive to what I wish to say tonight. Thank you so much. Well, it's always a great pleasure to be back here. I came to the University of Kansas in 1991 in the midst of the Clarence Thomas hearings um, as the first Koch Fellow at the University of Kansas and spoke in the law school. And as I recall, the day that I arrived here was the day that Senator Joseph Biden took a copy of my book on takings, waved it in front of Clarence Thomas, and announced to the world that anyone who believes in the stuff that is found in this particular volume does not deserve to sit on the Supreme Court. Um, I thought that there was some truth to that uh, particular observation, but it, I always associate the Dole situation with the president, and I also associate it very much with this entire controversy of how it is that we're supposed to deal with various matters of judicial interpretation in the Constitution, whether it be the federal Constitution on the one hand or any particular state Constitution on the other. So the topic, at least, is one which is long and near and dear to my heart. And in trying to deal with this question, there are lots of things that one has to worry about in the field of constitutional interpretation. But particularly for people who are not lawyers, I think it's extremely important that you set the background to figure out why it is that this issue is rather more complicated and more vexed than many issues of interpretation that arise in connection with various kinds of contracts or statutes. If you look at our Constitution, it's an extremely complicated and elaborate doctrine. It's a result of conscious planning, and what it does, in effect, is it seeks to divide uh, the powers of government to three branches, into the legislative advantage branch in Article I, it covers the executive branch in Article II, and in the third branch, in fact, it then covers the judicial power. Uh, the document contains many particular statements about the allocation of work amongst these branches, but it would be a big mistake to assume that it is a complete text that covers all sorts of issues. And one of the issues that is extremely difficult to fathom when you look at the Constitution, which essentially influences the views of some with respect to its interpretation, 
is the question of whether or not the Supreme Court of the United States and consequently all lower courts of the United States and indeed all state courts can invalidate legislation on the grounds that it is in contradiction to some of the express provisions of the Constitution. For many people, since judicial review is basically the hallmark of the American system, they assume that its pedigree is simply beyond question and beyond doubt. And it turns out exactly the opposite is true. If the view of clarity were in fact correct, you would expect to find in our Constitution a provision which said something of the following nature. The Supreme Court and all lesser federal courts have the power to invalidate any statute passed by Congress or the state which is in contradiction or in contravention of the provisions contained in the federal Constitution. There is no such provision that is there. The only question is whether or not by inference you can decide to infer that that particular power should in fact rest with the courts rather than being done in some other way. If you look then at the constitutional text and are trying to figure out what kinds of provisions might be able to deal with this issue, the first problem you have to face is how are you going to have a system of judicial trumps with respect to constitutional invalidation and judicial review in a document which essentially constantly believes in divided powers in which first one branch of government has an advantage over a second, then the second over the third, and the third over the first. And this, of course, was a very conscious effort to make sure that all the keys to the kingdom were not placed in the hands of a single individual or a small group of individuals, the basic philosophical orientation of our Constitution being quite simply that we preferred a little bit of slowness and inefficiency in the way in which government operated on the one hand, opposed to having various kinds of rapidity under circumstances where it could lead to deposition or tyranny. And there are very explicit checks or limitations on the nature of the judicial power. Uh, the first point, which I think is to mention, is that the lower courts in the United States federal system are left for Congress to create or abolish. And to the extent that you decide to abolish these courts, what you do is you necessarily switch more of the power over to state courts, which is an implicit check on the judiciary. More importantly, if you look at what the Constitution says about the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, it says in many cases that the Supreme Court shall have appellate jurisdiction, which means the right to hear appeals on matters of law and fact, meaning all sorts of things that could rise in these particular cases, subject to such regulations and exceptions as the Congress shall establish. And so you have the following very odd situation. If Congress can deny the appellate jurisdiction of the Supreme Court in certain kinds of cases, in accordance with its own judgment, how is it that the Supreme Court will have the final say with respect to the constitutionality of all laws? There is, in other words, a deep degree of contradiction between the proposition that the courts have the final say and the clear textual inference that the court can be stripped of its powers by actions for Congress. And the number of ingenious professors who have tried to find out that exceptions don't mean exceptions in the way in which you interpret the Constitution has been very, very large. But I think it is widely understood that the tension between these two elements, the judicial review on the one hand and the ability of Congress to strip the courts of its power on the other hand, are in fact very, very severe and require a great deal of thought. One of the things that came up at the dinner we had beforehand was an observation that I made, which is in trying to construe the Constitution, you never want to get to the point where you actually have to resolve these tensions by having, for example, the Congress try to exercise its ability to strip the court on particular questions, precisely because you have no idea of how this is going to come out and that the success of a document depends on a certain degree of cooperation and a certain willingness to adhere to kinds of shared historical standards which will in fact cure or at least soften some of the difficulties that are associated with particular kinds of constitutional provisions. So the bottom line is the case for judicial review under these circumstances seems in many cases to be somewhat difficult. In fact, this is reinforced if one goes back and looks at Marbury and Madison, the first of the cases that deal with this particular problem. And what is it that I think is instructive about Marbury and Madison is as follows. It was a case in which somebody sought a writ of mandamus, and mandamus for the non-lawyers means we shall command or we command you to do a particular thing. In this case, it was an order to James Madison to recognize Marbury as having been appointed as a member of a certain court or a certain commission. It doesn't matter which for these purposes. And what Marbury did is he sued in the United States Supreme Court in its original jurisdiction saying, hey, order this particular thing. 
Our friend Justice Marshall looks at the Constitution and its provisions on original jurisdiction, sees that they quite clearly do not cover this case, and says, I just refuse to issue the commission whether it's justified to give it or not, because this case doesn't go here. And the Congress, through the Judiciary Act of 1789, cannot confer upon us a jurisdiction that the Constitution explicitly denies. In one way to read this case has no problem whatsoever with the exceptions clause that I referred to except the section before. Because even if you could strip the power of the Supreme Court to knock down various kinds of legislation, there's nothing that you can do to force it through Congress to take cases that it simply believes that it ought not to take. So one way to look at the Constitution is to say that the Supreme Court has the power of judicial review to the extent that it could ignore commands by the other branches of government that it do things that the Constitution um, basically does not allow it to do and leave open the question as to whether or not the Supreme Court can command other branches of government to do things that they don't think they ought to do. In other words, the original view of constitutional interpretation and judicial review may have been all branches of government are equal and coordinate. And so what happens is each of them has to have its own view of what the Constitution requires. And if these are inconsistent, the way in which you resolve the tension is to make sure that no branch of government can compel any other branch of government to do what it wants. In fact, that has never been, in the long run, the American view of the subject. When we talk about judicial review, we talk about it as having a certain degree of punch and clout. And what that means is, if the court says that something has to be done, the executive branch and the legislature have to yield to its judgment on legality and cannot interpose their own judgment. In other words, the power that you have in judicial review is not simply defensive. It doesn't simply allow the court to keep the legislature and the president at bay. It's offensive. It allows the court to tell those guys what it is that they can do. Now, once you are conscious of the enormous limitations that are associated with the uses of executive power, whether of judicial power, the question then comes, how is it that when you apply the particular duty to see whether or not a statute is constitutional or not, do you read the Constitution? And in this particular point, there are two attitudes, and it turns out that they lead to radically different results on the matter of walking the line and figuring out how you deal with judicial restraint. The first of these attitudes is essentially somebody that says, look, if in fact you realize just how tenuous the foundations are of judicial review, and if you understand that it's a really big deal to nullify the combined judgment of the president on the one hand and the Congress on the other, then you bend over backwards to avoid striking down legislation on the grounds that it basically interferes or upsets various kinds of constitutional provisions. And you take this attitude pretty much across the board. You do so with respect to structural provisions on how it is that the government ought to be organized at either the federal or the state level. And you do it on the other class of great provisions in our Constitution, those that deal with the protection of various forms of individual rights. And your whole sorts of attitude is to back off. Uh, in constitutional law at this particular point in time, this is commonly called the rational basis test. The words have absolutely no cognitive meaning that bears with the particular test. It doesn't mean that you have to make a rational proof that something is or is not constitutional. What it basically means is if you could come with one plausible argument that you know to be wrong to support the constitutionality of a particular statute, believe the bad argument rather than believing the good ones that are raised on the opposite side. So it's in fact a very tolerant, very forgiving standard of judicial review. And in, many, in the view of many people, myself included, it often allows you to get away with blue murder when it turns out you're dealing with legislation. So to give you one sorts of things that I think are of immense importance with respect to the modern government, I'll just give you a couple of examples. One of the things that there is no explicit provision for in the Constitution is the creation of independent administrative agencies that are not answerable to the present in terms of the discharge of their various executive functions. And yet somehow or other, if you believe in this system of deference, you're going to allow the Congress and the President to create these kinds of agencies. And so you'll get things like the National Labor Relations Act and so forth, which operate in quasi-independent status. They have both investigative functions on the one hand and adjudicative functions on the other. And where you get this is anybody's guess. But if you're deferential, you can say the President and the Congress are allowed to pool their functions. It's all necessary and proper to the creation of good government. And so therefore, this kind of stuff is perfectly okay.
If you come out of a different condition and you say, look closely at the necessary and proper clause, it doesn't seem to allow the government to change the way in which it does business. The whole point of a system of separation of powers is to make sure that the President and the Congress can't combine together to change their respective roles or to merge their particular powers. And so the freedom of contract argument simply doesn't make any sense in the conduct of dealing with various forms of government power. And another kind of issue has to do with the scope of the Commerce Clause. Um, if one is very serious about the question of what it means to talk about Congress amongst the several states, and one ought to do that way, then to the extent that you decide to rec regulate local manufacture or local agriculture or local mining, it doesn't look like it's inter-border, interstate transactions over state borders. It rather looks as though it's a matter of local affairs to be governed by the states exclusively. And yet, sure enough, if you decide, in effect, that you've got to give Congress the benefit of the doubt, you will use a rational basis test to say, well, there's always some connection between feeding your own grain to your own cows, which is a serious actual historical advantage, and the price of Greek in some other state, and so therefore you could regulate this under the federal power. And it is really quite extraordinary that essentially one of the reasons why constitutional interpretation is so difficult for laymen and indeed for lawyers to understand is that the dominant trope of you just give these guys deference in the way in which they construe their provisions is so determinative of outcomes that after a while, if you take that particular position, you know foreordained that whatever has happened is going to be okay. So you then have to ask the question whether that is the appropriate standard of adjudication. If it is, you can pretty much say whatever the court's role in this thing is, it's going to be relatively inconsequential. The real power with respect to rights and duties is going to be determined exclusively through the political process. Now, why is this position very tenuous and very difficult? It's because once you decide that we have judicial review, then the issue is how do you read particular provisions of a constitution which don't seem to sound like rational basis stuff at all? So if you actually start looking at the provisions of the Constitution, it turns out that virtually all of them are written and worded in very powerful, simple declaratory sentences, which says you've got to do it right or you fall outside uh, the boundaries of the Constitution. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. It doesn't read as Congress may make any law abridging the freedom of speech so long as it has some preposterous reason to put forward to say why under these circumstances it should be allowed to do so. If the provision says, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation, it doesn't seem to mean that the Congress can figure out any kind of indirect benefit that would come from taking property, and that will make it all for public use. And so the great tension that one has is, if in fact you start down the road and come to the conclusion that you are dealing with a series of documents that have rather powerful constitutional clauses with it, rational basis doesn't seem to fit very well. And in fact, if you go look at the judicial system, one of the things that makes it so difficult to understand is that there is no uniform norm of rational basis interpretation under our Constitution. Quite the opposite. What you do is you have, in some cases, certain freedoms or certain classifications that are regarded as especially important, and for those, the court will apply a very high level of scrutiny and strike down statutes which they think err in some rather minor provision, so that, for example, the clause dealing with freedom of speech is thought to be clear enough such that in defamation cases, it is unconstitutional to place the burden of proving the falsity of the statement on a plaintiff. You're going to have to show that the defendant has to bear the burden to show its proof. So here you get a provision which is read so closely that what it does is it interferes with and alters the, value, the burdens of proof on particular questions that arise in the course of humdrum litigation, particularly in suits having to do with defamation brought by public figures or by public officials. So that you have this really very inconsistent attitude in which some cases you come down on people with both feet really hard, and in other cases you turn a blind eye to things that look to be manifestly improper. Now, the question is twofold. One is, what's the right way in which to read various sorts of constitutional doctrines? And secondly, is there any way in which we can find how to justify or to explain the split between those provisions that get this really super-duper deferential treatment and those things which are read extremely toughly? And the whole area of walking the line is made immensely more complicated than would otherwise be the case because of the real difficulties associated with these issues. And turning to the first question of constitutional interpretation, 
Uh, this is a very difficult problem. And the way in which I got involved in constitutional interpretation for the law first time was long before I started law school in America. As I mentioned to some people at dinner earlier, my original legal training was in Oxford, and the first course that I ever studied there was Roman law. And when the Romans had to deal with interpretation, they had the following problem. Any statute they drafted, in Latin to be sure, they drafted in stone, and it was very difficult to change it. And so when you hear the expression today that this thing happens to be written in stone, they were not talking about this as some kind of a loose metaphor. What they were talking about is the utter finality that comes when you take this thing and you chip it on some kind of a tablet so that the rest of the world will know exactly what it says. And the particular statute which informed my view of constitutional interpretation was something known as the Lex Aquilia, which is the Roman doctrine which talks about when it is that one person has to be responsible in damages for the injury to the slave or the field animal of another person. And what happens is they say if you happen to kill that animal uh, unlawfully, you are then responsible to pay damages for its death. And if you look at this thing, it's all of about you know, 18 or 20 words long. And if you try and then figure out why it is that this thing starts to generate thousands upon thousands of interpretive words, it turns out that there are two relatively important principles which, when brought to bear, explains why it is that tiny principles of constitutional protection generate huge bodies of law. And let me see if I can mention to you what these are. The first of the principles is something which we call the rules with respect to circumvention. That is, when you start to impose upon somebody an explicit prohibition about the kinds of things that they're allowed to do and the kinds of things that they're not allowed to do, the first thing you think about this as a kind of a cross between a lawyer and an economist is these guys don't like whatever it is that you're going to do which is going to limit the kind of freedom that they have. And so what they're going to try to do is to find some way to skirt the literal language of the statute in order to achieve their private objective with minimum disruptions of their plan. So you tell me that I can't kill anybody? Well, I understand what that means. It means I can't hit them over the head with a brick. And so you say, well, I've got a better idea. What I'll do is I'll force some poison down their mouth because that might not be a killing. And then somebody says, who are you kidding? And so then you say, well, I won't do it quite that way. What I'll do is I'll put four poison in front of them, dress it up as though it's a really wonderful piece of food, and then when they eat and swallow the stuff, they'll die. Don't blame me. I didn't kill them. They killed themselves when it turns out that they ate the food. These were very serious issues in Roman law. The poison cases were not only the matter of, of literature and I, Claudius, they were also the matter of real litigation. And time and time again, what they said is, if you engage in behavior, which doesn't amount to a killing, because somebody has to voluntarily swallow the stuff, <clears throat> we will look and make sure that those kinds of behaviors turn out to be illegal. And so when you get to the federal constitution, the question is what counts as a search and seizure? And at this point, it's clearly going through somebody's house counts as that. But what about if you simply stand by the eaves <clears throat> and try to overhear everything that's going on there? Does that kind of stuff count as a search or a seizure? And sure enough, since it turns out that the trespassory entry is not necessary in order to effectuate the snooping, the Supreme Court, in a wide variety of cases, used the same anti-circumvention principle that was identified in Roman law and said, anybody who eavesdrops, anybody who uses a microphone and trying to hear a conversation and so forth, is engaged in a search, and so therefore is subject to the constitutional requirements dealing with reasonableness on the one hand or with the issuance of a warrant on the other. And no matter what provisions of the Constitution you look to, whether you're talking about speech, and its regulation or taking of property as opposed to merely regulating its use, you're always worried about the fact that government officials, when told that they can't do one thing, will have a political pressure to do just that thing in some slightly different way so that the coverage principles turn out to be extremely important. And they can take forever to decide. Is new dancing counter speech is a classic illustration as to whether or not certain forms of expressive conduct are going to be protected by the First Amendment, over which there are then enormous debates. So that's the first reason why it's very hard to do constitutional interpretation. And the second reason why it turns out to be extremely hard is that if you go back to my Roman example, it turns out there are lots of times when you kill somebody else that you're perfectly justified in so doing. And so what the Romans then do is they say, well, you know, if you kill somebody in self-defense, that's perfectly okay. Well, is it all the time? Suppose, in fact, what you do is you kill somebody because he's attacked you, but you could have gotten rid of the attack without murdering the guy simply by hindering him. 
Can you use excessive force in these kinds of situations? Can you use hot pursuit? It goes on and on. And when you get to the federal law, the reason why constitutional interpretation, even a strict interpretation universe, is very hard is that every individual guarantee, every grant of jurisdiction, to some extent, is going to be subject to various kinds of implied exceptions. If I say one thing over and over again when I teach constitutional law to my students, it's this. Most of the great 19th century treatises dealing with individual rights of liberty and property have in their title the police power. If you look at the Constitution, those words are nowhere in the text anywhere. And yet there is no one who believes that the protection of liberty and property in the Constitution in its various guises are so enormous that there is no implied limitation on how people may behave. If you want, again, the usual situation, we know that I own my property and I'm entitled to do with it what I please. Does that mean I'm entitled to kill you by virtue of the fact that I own the gun? And the answer under these circumstances is clearly no. So now if it turns out I, somebody takes the gun from me when I'm about to kill you, is that a taking for which he has to pay me just compensation under the takings clause? And the answer that most people say is, if you really want to encourage mayhem and worse in the United States, all you do is you tell everybody when they threaten to harm another individual, we'll buy them off. And that will mean that you'll get a huge numbers of threats and you'll be paying all of your resources to make sure that people don't kill somebody else. And that becomes effectively the end of civil society because everybody can engage in the exact thing. So we need under those circumstances the power to use coercion. And so what happens is you develop an enormous jurisprudence which talks about when it is justified in the name of the health or the safety or the morals or the general welfare of the public interest to place some limitations on what it is that government can do, or rather on what individuals can do in the exercise of their liberty and of their property. So the constitutional provisions that talk about freedom of speech do not protect you in the commission of fraud, in the commission of libel. They do not deal with a whole variety of other situations when you threaten to attack another individual and so forth. If you go back to the private law, libel is a very big field. You go back to the private law, fraud is a very big field. You go back to the private law, assault and battery is a very big field. And by necessary induction, you must bring all of those knowledge and understandings to bear in order to deal with the First Amendment. So, for example, if you go back to the great subversive actions cases that took place right at the end of the First World War, somebody had to decide the question whether or not when Eugene Debs decided to bring down the United States by giving a fiery address to the Socialist Convention in 1920, he ought to go to jail for subversion, which the Supreme Court said, in fact, they could do. Um, most of us would regard that as a little bit over the top, and it's not good law today, but it indicates to you that no matter how hard you are, as a textualist with respect to the Constitution, you're going to have to worry about all these things. Looked at in this fashion, strict scrutiny is not an easy thing to execute because you have to worry about the circumvention issues and you then also have to worry about the justification issues. And one of the reasons why people tend to move towards a rational basis theory on the other side of this issue is it sort of gets rid of all the hard slogging that takes place. Well, the question then is, when are you prepared to sort of give the carte blanche so that none of this stuff matters, and when are you prepared to fight? And on this particular issue, as a textual matter, it's very difficult to find any hierarchy in the different kinds of constitutional provisions that are put before you. It turns out in these cases, they're all written in the same kind of prose, they're all written in ink, they're all part of the doctrine, they're all adopted in exactly the same fashion. Why is it some of them get strict scrutiny and why is it others of them get to be a pass? <clears throat> to make the issue much more concrete in modern terms, one of the things that we know is that regulations on speech are always looked at under a presumption of suspicion, whereas regulation on your ability to enter into an ordinary trade of business are generally greeted with warmth, almost enthusiasm by the United States Supreme Court, so that virtually none of them are going to be struck down. What's the explanation that's going to be given? Well, one of the explanations that is most, I think, important in this particular area is whether or not this stuff has something to do with political abuse or whether it does not. And the basic intuition of our court is they become amateur political scientists and what they say in those areas where we think the political process is likely to break down, then we're going to give strong constitutional protection, particularly to what they call discrete and insular minorities those groups who systematically lose in the political process. And this was essentially introduced in 1938 as a way of signaling that the Supreme Court would become much more active 
in the scrutiny of various kinds of practices, particularly in the South, that had to deal with racial segregation, which culminated in, of course, in a very Kansas case known as a Brown versus the Topeka Broad of education, right? I mean, it's a, kind of a local case that got involved in, in this whole sorts of issues. The difficulty that we have with this is that the intuition is very good, and for the most part, you're much more likely to see constitutional guarantees broken to the extent that you have a political process which is dominated electorally by one faction, which is quite prepared to take advantage of another. The problem about using this as a rationale is it doesn't allow you to differentiate between one clause and another. The same kinds of political pressures that can be used to make sure that blacks are going to be denied the franchise under a series of ridiculous requirements for voting can be also used to make sure that the optometrist cannot go into contact, into business against the ophthalmologist if they seem to have more political clout. And so if you start to look at most of the kind of straight economic regulation through zoning or other kinds of practices that are imposed, virtually all of them show the same kinds of pathologies in which local political constellations and majorities, factions as it were, can dominate the political process and strip a minority of their interests. So the rationale in this case is extremely potent to explain why it is that you have tough scrutiny in some cases, but it turns out, given the endemic natures of politics, which I think many people in the Dole Institute are quite familiar with, there is no subject matter on which the suspension of political pressures takes place. You'd show me something that could go before a legislature, I'll show you something in which coalitions backbiting and intrigue and double cross is going to be a perfectly appropriate way. Is that going to happen in all cases? I don't think anyone ought to be so cynical as to say that every piece of legislation that comes out is necessarily corrupt. But what I do think one has to be aware of is that there's no subject matter limitations on where corrupt legislation takes place. So the same legislature which can start to introduce a perfectly magnificent code that deals with various things on commercial transactions can start to create all sorts of preferences and biases in favor of bankers as opposed to mortgagees or something else, and that you always have to be alert to the fact that there is no kind of insulation. So now, where does this leave us with respect to interpretation? It leaves us, I think, with the clear insight that you can't figure out that drawing the line ought to be differently with respect to different kinds of provisions as opposed to other kinds of provisions, and that you have to have the same attitude pretty much in a clause-independent way because the political failure edge, um, rationales don't allow you to distinguish. So then is there any way that you could start to think about when it is that you ought to be tough on a political body and when it is you ought to be relevantly tolerant to the way in which it operates? And when I talked about this subject yesterday, I proposed a line, and I've thought about it a bit overnight, and I'm still willing to stick with the same speech I gave at least for another 24 hours until somebody disabuses me of the mistakes that I'm about to make. And how is it that I think about this? Well, to begin with, I'm a small government type, and there are lots of things that governments do which I would rather not see them do at all. But on the other hand, no matter how small a government type you are, somebody's got to be running the Congress, somebody's got to be running the highway department, somebody's got to be running the military, somebody may even have to be running the public schools. And what happens is when you have charge for the operation of a particular facility, it seems to me that it's perfectly appropriate to say, in running that particular facility, you have to have some degree of discretion in how it is that the thing operates. For those of you who are law students who have taken corporate law, for those of you who are lawyers, you will know that there is something on the books of corporate law called the business judgment rule. And what that says is if you're the board of directors of a particular firm and you have faced with a whole variety of tough problems and you turn out to make a wrong choice so that the corporation loses money, you're not going to be an insurer to your shareholders such that you have to pay them back dime for dime every cent that the corporation made or lost in virtue of your decision. The basic intuition is you don't pay the directors back every dime that they make for you when they make a right decision under a tough circumstance. And if you want to get the benefit of the good decisions, you've got to take the pain of the bad decisions. And what the business judgment rule says, that unless there's an explicit conflict of interest, that is, the member of the board of directors is engaged in a self-dealing transaction, you have to give them the benefit of the doubt, and if they act in good faith, they're immunized from liability. And the great advantage to shareholders of that particular rule is even though they may lose in a particular case, they get the enormous advantage that good people are now willing to serve 
because they know that any bad decision, and there's always going to be some in the life of a corporation, is not going to mulk them in damages to the point where it's no longer them taking the position. And so the fundamental cardinal principle of corporate governance is you take your chances with the electors whom you've elected. Now, my own view about the political process is, frankly, I don't like it very much. Uh, and frankly, most people in the political process don't like how to do very much. But these guys are charged with running complex institutions. And to the extent that they're running schools, to the extent that they're running highway departments and so forth, they are going to be making one hard decision after another. And I think that the appropriate attitude ought to be that with respect to the way in which they allocate funds, with respect to the way in which they prioritize various kinds of endeavors, they ought to be given the benefit of the doubt. And what does that translate into? It translates into something that looks very much like the rational basis test. Show deference such that if there's the remotest argument that they made the right kind of decision, if they did the kinds of things that any sensible private board of directors might do and might do erroneously, then you're going to let them go. And so you get a low standard of review under these circumstances. Well, where is it that things now start to come on the opposite side? Well, lots of times the legislature is not trying to figure out how to run a highway department or run a school system and so forth. What it's going to do is to figure out who can enter into a certain trade or business or who could build a house in a certain kind of neighborhood. And to the extent that you get these various forms of regulation, which is designed to restrict the liberty or property of individuals acting in their private capacity, now you've got the state going on the offensive. And what they're going to do is really impact particular individuals very heavily. And if, in fact, they wipe these people out by the restrictions that they impose, I think it's perfectly appropriate to say that you've got to do a hell of a lot better in the way in which you restrict private initiatives through regulation and confiscation than you do in those situations where you're trying to run the government affairs. So the line that I'm trying to draw is to the extent that government acts as a regulator and you know that it's subject to these political pressures, you're going to have to look a little bit harder than them than you are in the cases where it's running a business, where you know that it's inescapable that they're going to have to make these kinds of choices. And if it turns out in the regulatory fashion they don't impose a zoning law, that's not so terrible. If it turns out that they can't build a single public school when they start to deal with public appropriations, that's very difficult and very different. So now how does this start to play out when you're looking at particular cases? And let me mention three cases to you which I think start to show the situation and then we can open it up for general discussion. Now, the first of these cases is one that virtually everybody has heard about, and it's the Kelo case. That's a situation where the Constitution says, if, in fact, you wish to take property, you must take it for a public use. And it turns out, if I were to go through the entire story, the explication of what it means to talk about taking this for public use are extremely complicated. This is not an easy field to master. But in this particular circumstance, what happened is you had a town which decided that it was going to take a bunch of private homes and sort of warehouse the land after they blew up the buildings because they wanted to put some kind of large private development on the property, even though none of the major projects that they already had in line required the use of the land that they were going to take. And sure enough, what the Supreme Court did was to say, we apply our rational basis test to figuring out what it means by a public use. And what does that mean? It meant when this thing started to come forward, they say, well, look, there may be some long-term or indirect benefit to the community of New London in virtue of doing this, and I can't figure out what's going on, but it's the job of the professional planners to decide that, and so we're not going to look at any of the evidence which indicates that this is just a land grab for the benefit of private developers, and they let the thing go through. And most ordinary people came up and they just had looks of disbelief on their face. Part of it was judicial construction of the Constitution. What does the word private use mean if any time you take property, it's always for a private use? Just might as well read the words out of the Constitution. And then they started to look and they said, you know, what's the purpose of government? It isn't to seize property for no reason at all. It's to protect property from seizure by the use of public funds. This seems to be a complete inversion. And one cannot forget just how powerful the outrage was. And, of course, it took place in the most potent of all methods, open derision in which large numbers of people essentially belittled and abused Justice Stevens for writing such a ridiculous opinion, saying that the man can't read if he thinks that public and private is synonymous. After all, we did not say that the property may be taken for public or private use. We used one, and it was meant to exclude at least something, and under his view of the world, it excludes nothing. 
And I think that's a classically good illustration of why it is that you don't want to have a strong rational basis test which allows anything to go when you're dealing with constitutional protection. The world will not come to an end if the city of New London cannot rip down houses in order to leave land vacant, which essentially was its short-term plan. All right. uh, next case, somebody said, you've got to talk about Kansas. And so they gave me the Montoy case, which has to do with public education here. And if you think about it, that necessarily sort of comes on the opposite side of the line. That's a case on how you allocate funds. And here you have exactly the same kind of duality running in the opposite direction. You have the question of who normally decides priorities, both within the field of education and between education and other areas which call for public expenditure, like housing in the modern state, like health care, like roads, like highways, like business development, whatever it is. And the usual view with respect to budgets, unless you are really engaging in outright favoritism for one group instead of another, is that the fellow who controls the budgetary function is going to be your elected body. So if you don't even know anything about the priorities of this stuff coming in, the clear inclination is that political decisions on allocations of budget are one thing for which courts are not good at. In other words, the basic pattern of separation of powers that you have is that the court acts as a checking function. It blocks excesses of legislative power in some way, but it doesn't start to initiate spending programs. That seems to be a matter for political deliberation. Well, you know, this is simply a priority. It is not essentially a constitutional argument. So what you then have to do is to look to the constitutional text and see what it says. And when I did this with respect to the Montoy case, I was really quite astonished in one way. This is what the Supreme Court said, of Kansas said, was the clause under which it was acting. And it quoted the following language. It says, the legislature shall provide for, and then it gives you a list, intellectual, educational, vocational, and scientific improvement. It italicizes the word shall, and it italicizes the word improvement. By, it says, and this is how you do it, by creating and maintaining a system of public schools full stop. That's what it says. And then what it says is when we see the word shall, that means it's an imperative, which I think is something which could be read quite innocently to say, well, you have to do something in the area of public schools without telling you how much. And then it gives this very weird meaning to the word improvement by saying, hey, it has to keep on getting better all the time so that if your schools don't get better each and every period, you're not trying to improve things. The natural reading of the sentence is much more precatory, and what it really seems to mean is, well, the reason why we have public schools is we think that expenditures in this field will improve citizenship, but it's not an argument which says we go inexorably onward and upward in each particular case. So one of the rules of constitutional construction is don't italicize your favorite words. Read all words equally and read them in context. But the amazing thing is they never bothered to finish the sentence. They stopped before there were 20 other words, which I think, once you put them in context, indicate that this is not the way in which you want to read anything. And what are those words, they say? Well, the next word says, or educational institution or related activities, so that this whole improvement stuff doesn't apply only to public schools. It also applies to these other educational institutions and related activities. And now do you really believe that the word shall and improve have the same meaning with respect to them that they might have with respect to public schools so that any time you run a related activities, you can never cut back on it? What you can only do is to increase the amount of expenditures on it to make them better than that they've ever been before and to do so with the strong imperative of shall. One of the things that happens is when you read clauses which have a series and there's one set of words that modify all three words in the series, presumably it has the same meaning with respect to all three, and the meaning which might be moderately plausible with respect to public schools standing alone becomes essentially bizarre when you read it with respect to it. And then the next thing it says, well, now what about these schools? And they say, in such manner as may be chosen in order to organize and change as provided by law. And in fact, I don't have the exact words, they always slip my mind, but the remaining clause essentially said you can do two things. You can organize and you can change the way in which these schools are operated, and both of those words seem to suggest that you could go up or down, and since they were preceded by the word may, it suggests that the duty is to fund the schools, but you have the choice as to how it is selected. And as you may as, as, you may as by law provide, 
suggests that the Constitution doesn't handle the questions of appropriation. These are going to be handled by the way in which laws are made, namely through the legislature. And since you've got another may by law provide, or may provide by law, what you do is you have a situation, if you look at the whole thing, where what they seem to be saying is we've got this largest educational establishment. We'd like to have it because we think that public education in general is going to be an improvement. It's got many activities. You guys have to maintain and organize it, and you can figure out how to run it so long as you do so by law. If you put the words that were omitted without so much as a reference in any of the cases back in, it completely inverts the meaning of the paragraph. And so what happens is you get this real crisis in constitutional law. What happens is the truth about the matter is that the theory that I've talked about, which is the distribution between regulatory functions on the one hand and essentially management functions on the other, is one which probably animated the drafters of the, of the Kansas Constitution. If you read only half the sentence, you don't get that. If you read the whole thing, you do. So the first rule of constitutional construction is always read full sentences. Never truncate these things. I know it sounds so hard and so strange to say, but the number of times that I have found Supreme Court decisions that quote parts of sentences without quoting the rest of them, changing the meaning, is depressingly large. And so therefore, this whole debate over strict construction and less strict construction, to some extent, is why are you even there when there's such a more basic problem that you have? And this is a case in which they, if they had simply ignored the text and it stuck with the basic assumption that management functions are legislative choice rather than essentially constitutional imperatives, you would have never had the decision which appropriated large sums of additional money above and beyond the additional sums that the legislature had already appropriated. Now, just to prove that I don't have any particular bias on this thing, I don't believe you should have public schools, but that's a different debate. Um, um, but I can't fight that in, in Kansas under the local law. At least I don't think I can. Um, there's the great question how you deal with affirmative action under federal law. And we have an equal protection clause which says that no person shall be denied the equal protection of the laws. And, you know, that's not a terribly unreasonable kind of provision. And there's no doubt when it comes to the role of the state as a regulator, this really has to have some powerful bite. And it would be utterly unconscionable if the courts were prepared to say, we have honored equal protection of laws each time when we punish black offenders for 10 years for a particular offense when a person who is white gets only a five-year sentence. It's very clear that the sort of strict scrutiny that you give with respect to racial classifications insofar as the coercive application of the laws at stake is something that you have to believe in. What about when you're running a school system? Well, it turns out at the university level, affirmative action is a very complicated issue. I dare say that there are many people in this room who are strongly in favor. I dare say that there are a few of you, probably a minority, who are strongly against it. And I think there are probably lots of you who are vexed about how it is that this ought to be run. When I was the interim dean at the University of Chicago, I had to face this question along with everybody else. And, you know, the answer was that there was no internal sentiment for abolishing the programs. There was a high level of internal sentiment for making sure they ran in what we thought to be a responsible fashion. And it would bore you enormously to figure out what it was the defects were in our programs and the kind of interim measures that we could do. Well, it turns out, you know, Michigan's got a law school, and they got a dean, and he's got the same political pressures, and he's trying to run the same kind of institution. Why is it that he's going to be hit with a colorblind policy when in competition with us? Why is it that he cannot do the sorts of things that we've had? And I think the right attitude is to therefore say, whatever the University of Chicago is going to do, the University of Michigan can do as well. And if you found that there were no private institutions that wanted to have a program of overt discrimination against minority candidates, it would be pretty tough to let any public school do it. Although, ironically, in earlier times when there was a lot of discrimination, I think the public bodies could probably go along with it. And you change the private sentiments, you then change what happens in the public side. And the truth about the matter is when there was strong public sentiment in favor of segregation, the Supreme Court did absolutely nothing whatsoever to stop it. Quite the opposite. It allowed the state to impose its segregationist views on private institutions by mandating in a famous case called Berea College that you not have white and black students on the same campus in Kentucky as an exercise of its quote-unquote police powers, the term that I talked about before. So, I mean, one of the reasons you have to be careful about this is if the political and social consensus goes in one way, all this constitutional stuff is going to go by the boards. It requires a change in sentiment, 
And one of the reasons why you want to model private behavior, use private behavior as the model for public behavior, is you could change private behavior without political stuff. And as it starts to change, the standards that public governance is going to have to do will change with it. And I think that's actually the right way in which to effectuate this kind of reform. Well, there are other ways and other choices you have to make in how it is you run an affirmative action program. And one of them is you do it by gestalt, you do it by the numbers. And there is an extensive debate as to which is the correct way of doing it. And as somebody who's run these programs in general, I am more of a numbers guy than a gestalt guy. And you say, well, why, Professor Epstein, do you want to do all this? And I said, well, my view is the moment you start doing gestalt, politics plays two-part a role, and everybody starts calling up and trying to use influence and saying, I know my candidate's a real dummy when you look at the boards, but I can assure you he is a splendid person. Take him, don't take somebody who has a higher record. And those kinds of pressures can break you apart. And to the extent that you can say, look, we have a process, and only rarely do we allow deviations from it, you can stop a lot of abuse. Now, what the Supreme Court consists of nine judges, three of whom are former law professors, none of whom know the slightest thing about university admissions. And what happens is when they start to say that the gestalt is constitutionally OK and that the numbers are constitutionally suspect, what they are doing is treading into an area where managed prerogatives ought to be of the highest. And the net effect is that everybody says, OK, we'll do it your way. And then, of course, they will do it any way they want and just simply cover their tracks. You will get a form of essentially a silent resistance with respect to the norm. And the right particular attitude, therefore, is exactly what I said in the other cases. On these business judgments where there's a genuine view of differences of what's going on, you sort of stand back and give them their due. And when it turns out they're trying to use coercive power against ordinary individuals and their liberty and property, you get very, very tough on the way in which government works. Now, my hope is that people will then look at this, and I went on this happy note. Why on earth would we ever want to give that level of discretion to public officials? We know the political pressures are enormous, even when they're delegated to institutions. Well, if this is, in fact, a perception, my hope will be that with time, People will decide that, in general, governments are rather inefficient ways to run businesses, and there will be an effort to sort of reduce the size of the public scope and to increase the size of the public scope. How does that translate into Kansas? Well, remember, the mandate is to deal with public schools, other educational institutions, and related programs, not just public schools. Well, you could start to think of vouchers as being a way to deal with other educational programs, which essentially gives lump sum appropriations and remove some of the business discretion from public bodies. And if, in fact, people are unhappy about discretion, this may be a perfectly sensible way in which to channelize it. Not going to be clear that it's going to work in all cases, but it might in some. So in the end, the hope will be that you can shrink the discretionary part of government, expand the controls over its regulatory part, and do a little bit better than would otherwise be the case. But I think I have spoken enough, and so I'm not going to speak any more but I'm happy at this late hour to take questions by anybody who wishes to ask them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have two people that will um, have the mics for the questions, and I'll just kind of point to whoever, and you feel free to answer the question. Okay, somebody. This is terrible. Oh, is there there's a question in the hand back there? If your views of the uh, U.S. Constitution... Oh, is this Chris? Steve. Oh, Steve, okay. If your views of the U.S. Constitution uh, were held by the U.S. Supreme Court, what would be the biggest things the federal government does now that it would not be allowed to do in that, that world? And by biggest, I really mean dollar amount. Look at the federal budget. What would be the biggest things on the federal budget that would then be unconstitutional? Um, start with all the entitlement programs, okay? Um, my view about it is the ability of the federal government to find an effective way in which to run Social Security or Medicare or Medicaid would be essentially impossible to achieve under the kinds of views that I've talked about. Um, if you start the deal about the spending clause and, and deal so far as it's dealing with the common defense of the general welfare, the way in which I read those clauses is that they could spend the money on classic public goods. The definition of a public good is those things which you provide to one from which you cannot exclude another. Providing people with money for individual health care benefits is the opposite. Would I be apologetic of this? No. Bob Dole, for those of you who don't remember, voted against Medicare in 1965. And then in a weakness of soul, he recanted later on. But if you're trying to figure out what's going to happen to ruin the lives of the next generation, 
of the single biggest problem that we have is mandates that are effect created in terms of entitlements, and then what you do is once the entitlements are there, people could just spend and then you have to appropriate and appropriate and appropriate, and the health program is huge. The social security program is not quite as large. One will go bankrupt before the other unless we radically change the way in which we work, and every single sign that we've had of political discipline on these two areas has, in fact, failed. Um, if you look, for example, at the way in which they try to raise the retirement age for Social Security, what they do is, well, if you're born in 1942, it's 65 years. If you move in 43, it's 65 years in one month, and 44, 65 years in two months, or something like that. Then there's a 13-year gap in which nothing moves, and then they start picking it up again. Why? Because when the proposal was introduced, the dominant political coalition was in that period, and these folks wouldn't tolerate a reduction in their Social Security benefits, and so that's why you get this kind of grotesque type of situation. So I think those are the clearly number one stuff. Uh, if you get me started, the enforcement functions, of course, become very different. Um, you cannot have, under the views that I take of the Commerce Clause, uh, the direct regulation by the federal government of wages and hours of safety in manufacturing plants that are local. These all become state functions. And so this huge enforcement apparatus at the federal level necessarily disappears. When it's introduced at the state level, there will be systematic competition between states, which will tend to reduce the severity below what it is under a federal system. I think, in effect, the social losses that are achieved by creating these interferences with contract are extremely large, and I could argue that separately, and most of this stuff would go in the other way. So make no mistake about it. You know, you still get a large army, and you get a navy, and you get court systems, and you get public roads, and all the standard stuff that any minimalist theory of government is going to talk about. But essentially, by the time you went through this stuff, line by line through the federal budget, it would probably be somewhere around a fifth to a third of what it is today, which is a rather striking change. And now, of course, it's not possible to do it. You cannot turn around and say, for 30 years we've told you you're going to get Social Security benefits. We now decide that the program is unconstitutional. There you are, 82 years of age, we're cutting you off. Goodbye, sayonara. It's just the reversibility issue is the single hardest question to deal with because once you make a mistake, reliance grows up on it, and once reliance grows up, reversibility is only the work of a fool, not the work of somebody who's serious about government. And there is no question that in the progressive era, the key strategy of all the planners of the health care and social security system was to make reversibility impossible. Let me give you an illustration. If you took social security and said, look, we don't think you're going to save to your future, and require people to put money into their individual requirement, retirement accounts, this would be easy to fix if there were any mistake, because there are no wealth transfers between parties. The moment you put everybody's money into a big pool and you give it back in forms that they don't quite understand, nobody knows which money is theirs. Nobody knows what they're worth under the program. Trying to unscramble the omelet is next to impossible. Robert Ball, who is a Social Security Administrator, was so confident in the righteousness of this program that he essentially made it in a form that you could never undo it. And I remember being in a conference 30 years ago when I wasn't particularly influenced one way or another in politics, and I listened to this guy caught, and I became so much more conservative I wanted to kill the man, quite literally, because I knew exactly what he was doing, and I knew that 30 years later it would happen. You just listen to the way it went. It was this constant view that retirement is a deep mystery to ordinary individuals, so I've got to move in the government to take care of it. It's as though you can't have Keogh plans, and you can't hire financial advisors, and you can't rely on your employers to use any of these kinds of devices. It was either government or nothing. So you develop this model of human behavior in which everybody except the operators of the social security system turn out to be ignoramuses. And then, in fact, when you actually look at the operation, the only people who don't know how to budget are the people who in charge of trillions of dollars worth of funds. And for anybody here who is, say, under, at this point, the break-even point is probably around 40, you have to understand that 90% of your Social Security dollars are earmarked for somebody else, and by the time you come around, you're going to either be on the dole, and I don't mean the Robert dole, I mean on the poor dole, unless you create private and retirement accounts for your own benefits, because the wealth transfer system is that inexorable and that powerful. And so what you do is you build a set of entitlements for people you can't take it away, and then what happens is you systematically strip the opportunities from the younger folks. So this is a very, very serious social problem. Without question, every serious analyst, regardless of their political persuasion, understands that if you wish to keep the long-term fiscal health of the United States, you have to get that under control. 
Last version of this question, we have a program known as No Child Shall Be Left Behind, right? The whole Bush impulse on education. I, I think in the sense he is right to believe that there ought to be accountability for public schools. The way in which you achieve that is through private competition, by allowing vouchers, not through direct government regulation. The government regulation actually makes teachers union respectable because now you have to have somebody who's going to fight the federal government who gives you a set of tests which measure everything except what counts for a good education so that they have to teach to these kinds of programs. So this whole situation, the coercion and the whole budgetary stuff simply doesn't fall within the kinds of views of the Constitution that I have. So we're talking about big deals. We're not talking about small stuff. When people dislike what I say, they are not wrong to dislike it if they disagree with my position. They understand the full implications. This is not some sort of modest little change at the margin. This is a fundamental attack on the entire structure of modern New Deal sociology, first in the New Deal, then in the Great Society, and then with this recent stuff. And by the way, in many cases, it's Republican presidents like Richard Nixon and George Bush who pushed the worst of these reforms. So my condemnations are strictly bipartisan. All right, is there at least one, at least one more question? Come on, somebody. I have to beg you to ask a question. Oh, I've got two. Go uh, I lived in Washington State for a while, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, the trend in takings by regulation. In King County just recently passed a rule that uh, certain rural forest owners would only be allowed to uh, develop 10% of their lands if it was above a certain acreage. Uh, with no kind of compensation and sort of takings analysis, that, that's under challenge right now. I wonder if you could talk about sure. different states and jurisdictions doing that kind of regulation. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've actually been involved in some litigation of a similar sort in the state of Delaware. Uh, this is an endemic disease. I wrote a book called Takings, Private Property and the Power of Eminent Domain in 1985, which reached around page 314, the conclusion that the entire New Deal was unconstitutional. And along the way, I bashed all of these zoning kinds of restrictions. And let me explain to you the way in which I think about these kinds of problems. Uh, the first thing you have to do is to understand something about what the nature of property is, private property. And to the Supreme Court, private property involves only one incident, which is the right to exclude other people from your land. Everything else is more or less up for grabs. If you think about the entire private law from Roman times on forward, there has never been a single legal system in the way in which it adjudicates disputes between private neighbors, which has ever adopted such a foolish definition. It's not that exclusion doesn't matter. It's just that it's not sufficient because if you're quite literal about it, I may have the right to exclude others, but that doesn't even give me the right to enter my own land. So I can keep them all off and I can't get on there. And if you give people only the right to exclude, it means that there's no reason that they should be able to farm their land on the one hand or to develop it in any particular fashion on the other. And so what happens is they have given you one of the bundles of elements in the bundle of rights, but any coherent definition of property which is trying to figure out how you maximize the value of two parcels of land by side by side, would essentially condemn us to mass starvation if the only thing that was protected was the right to exclude and no rights of use or disposition were otherwise protected. So what happens in the private law, you keep on building up the rights on both sides, and you do so so long as it increases their mutual value. There then comes the point where certain uses are more destructive to your neighbor than beneficial to yourself, and those you stop. Those things are commonly known as the law of nuisance, okay? So essentially, the way in which you should think about the state is that what its job to do is to police boundary disputes between two or more individuals, which means that any time it passes a zoning ordinance which is designed to prevent a common law nuisance, there's no problem with it. But now look at these two people again, and suppose that you and the fellow sitting next to you each own large vacant tracts in Kane County out in Washington, and one guy says to you, your neighbor says to you, you know, Buster, I'm going to call you Buster, um, says, I don't like the fact that you want to build on your own land. So basically, I want you to only build on 10% of it. And what you would say to him is, buy a restrictive covenant on my use. And it turns out the value of the land to me, if I could build on all of it, is a million dollars. If I can only build on 10% of it, it's $900,000. I'd rather say $100,000, are you willing to pay me $900,000 for the restrictive covenant? And he looks at you and he says, am I crazy or something? I, what, what benefit is to me that you can't build on your land that I'm willing to pay you $900,000? So what happens is you do get covenants, often between neighbors, but generally speaking, it's got to be worth more to the fellow who takes it than the fellow who surrenders it. What the Supreme Court in its infinite wisdom has said is that restrictive covenants don't get any kind of examination because they don't allow the government to enter into the possession of the land. 
Your right to exclude is therefore, by its view, only compromised to the extent that there's been an entry by the state. Which means that when they want to impose that restrictive covenant on you, they could knock the value down by 900,000, right? On the other hand, the benefit that they get from it may be perfectly trivial, say $100,000. So the reason you want the takings clause is if you're given the government the option to regulate, which is what you do when you say they may take, you never want to give it to them for free because they'll always overconsume. It's roughly if you gave your neighbor the option to take all of your property that he wants, short of outright possession, he doesn't have to pay you a dime for it. This is suicide. And that's what they're doing in Kane County. What the Supreme Court did, starting in the zoning cases in 1926, was to say that regulation by way of restriction on use was to be treated more like competition and less like taking. And that's also absurd. The standard competitive cases, you own a piece of land, the guy next to you owns a piece of land. He puts a gas station on his lot, and you want to put one on your lot. It turns out having two gas stations are less profitable for both of you than if one of you had the monopoly in the neighborhood. Tough is the appropriate answer to that. He's not invading your land. He's in competition and consumers benefit more than the other two of you do by having some kind of restrictive agreement. So when the Supreme Court says that a legal prohibition on development should be treated, as it did in the Penn Central case, as a form of competitive loss, it managed to overturn two millennia of private law learning on the subject. So what happens essentially in Washington and every other state is we have two systems of property law. We have a highly efficient system of property law that regulate dispute between neighbors when one of them tries to regulate or limit the property of others, in which all the incidents of ownership are fully respected. And then we have this public system in which exclusion is given very high levels of protection and everything else is ignored. And those things which are value that the state can systematically ignore, it will underprice. If it can underprice, it will overconsume. If it overconsumes, it leads to resource distortion. So the key thing to understand is when you protect private property rights against that kind of silliness, you're not just simply saying property is sacred and the state is corrupt. What you're saying, in effect, is that the state gains are systematically likely to be lower than the private losses, and that any responsible social calculus that takes into account both would want to have a positive sum game, which you don't get. So the just compensation requirement is a way of exerting price discipline on government, and you've got to do that every bit as much with restrictive covenants, which is what this turns out to be, as you do with respect to occupation. And trying to get this across to the Supreme Court is like throwing bricks against a stone wall. They just simply shatter. The level of, I mean, I'm quite happy if this is on tape, the level of systematic judicial ignorance on the part of the justices, conservative and liberal alike, about how property systems work and how ought to be regulated is complete and total. And when you get that level of ignorance, what you're going to do is get that kind of social loss. It's not just simply a question of random error. You cannot develop a body of takings law that bad by mistake. You have to have a really powerful view. And what's the view? It's rational basis. Governments will only do things to the extent that they benefit the public at large. So you treat them as disinterested avatars of the world. Once you recognize that they're going to be responsive only to dominant political coalitions in these kinds of cases, you realize that rural landowners are a political minority and they can be swamped in statewide initiatives by folks who love to drive through somebody else's bare woods but don't have to bear any of the cost of those kinds of dislocations. Okay? All right. You had a question, ma'am? Well, it's more the, uh, the what, what uh -huh. do you see as the real repercussions of the, uh, the Connecticut, the New London uh, case? Yeah, the, the Kilo case? case? I mean, it seems like it's not, it's still rolling around and people are upset about it and I don't understand enough of it, but I just wanted to know what you feel the repercussions are down the road for well, other communities. Well, the, the, the word repercussion has got to be in the plural, as you put it, rather in the singular, because there's so many things that are going on simultaneously. One of them is the long-term political debate and the planners who are very powerful and very cohesive, they say you cannot condemn entire systems of public planning on the grounds that a silly operation of the state power happened to take case in this particular case. And so they say, don't change anything, we'll just mind our P's and Q's, and this is another version of the trust us thing, which results in the Kane County land use regulation. The truth about the matter is that they're not always wrong, and some planners are amazingly good in the way in which they balance public and private equities. But those guys can live with a much more stringent system of constitutional guidelines, so they're not going to be hurt very much, 
And on the other hand, the rogues are going to be really shut down, which is one of the things that you want to do with tougher kinds of restrictions. So there is the political debate. Then there is the legal reform debate, which starts to take place. And on here, the mixed results are decidedly spotty and very inconsistent. Um, in some cases, there's a genuine conceptual difficulty of how it is that you want the public use language to read once you decide that Kilo is wrong. It doesn't tell you what's right, right? And so there are all sorts of questions. Can you decide to take land, quote unquote, for public use if it turns out it's a toxic dump site and you wish to clean it up? Can you take land because it's blighted? Can you take land to assemble large facilities that are privately owned but have some public benefit like private hospitals? Can you take it for general economic development if it turns out you're in a truly depressed area, et cetera, et cetera? There's a lot of difference of opinion on those kinds of issues so that the pro-reform side is often divided amongst itself. And when you get a compromised version, the strong property fanatics, like myself perhaps, would say it's just not tough enough. We've got to do something about it. Then it also turns out that there's a long line of Supreme Court cases which in fact do allow, under conditions of strict necessity, takings for private benefit, as commonly understood. And those have been on the books for 150 years, and there's nobody who really thinks about the situation who thinks that those are the kinds of things that you want to upset. So when you start pointing out that you know, for hundreds of years you allowed a mine owner on the top of a hill who suddenly discovered his ore to be able to go over some wasteland in order to reach a railroad that was located on the other side or otherwise would not be able to use this mine at all. The holdout risk is too great in 1905. 1905, the Supreme Court said these kinds of extreme local conditions are so imperative that we're willing to allow cautiously an exception to the traditional public use requirement. And Justice Stevens gets rid of all the cautionary language, misquotes the passage entirely and deliberately, I might add, because I remember I put it in our own brief in exactly the right form, and he just picks the bits of it he likes and leaves the rest of it on the cutting room floor. And now, in effect, it looks as though you could do anything because private uses were always allowed. Well, if you're trying to draft this stuff, you really have to be very careful that you don't sort of mess up the law previous to 1937 in an effort to get after this case. Then there is the further dispute. Well, do we do this through legislation or do we do it through constitutional amendment? And there's a lot of anxiety on that particular question. Some states, like Illinois, did a pretty good political process. A woman named Susan Barrett ran a very respectable set of hearings, which I and a bunch of other people testified, and they came out with some bill which wasn't perfect, which was better than the status quo ante. So we don't know which way it's going to run. And then there's the third set of issues, and I'll just stop at this one, which is how does it influence the frequency and intensity of takings issue on the ground? And I think at this point the reaction to Kilo has been generally healthy. Developers and local governments now realize that the political opposition is going to be a lot stronger and more galvanized if they try to pull one of these acts than they did before. So it doesn't mean they stop doing it. It means that they do a little bit smaller project, a little bit stronger public just justification, a little bit more by way of public hearing, a little bit more by way of compensation and all the rest of the stuff. And so in some sense, in the long run, this issue, although still very serious, is probably tamped down 20, 30 percent from what it was when the decision came down. And so the answer is it's going to stir around for a long time because essentially unlike some of the other questions having to do with executive power and habeas corpus which are very important, people all have very strong views on what it means to take for public use. And they feel as though the Constitution has been trashed before their very eyes. And so that stuff leads to the jokes again. And you know, with Justice Stevens, somebody says, well, well, we're not with Justice Stewart. Well, we're going to condemn his little farmhouse to make Liberty Motel and so forth because that's for a public use. It's really a sign of saying we really believe in the security of property and we think that that is very heavily compromised when you allow the state to get these options, particularly since, as everybody concedes, that the compensation they pay is not fair anyhow because of another set of rather regrettable Supreme Court decisions which essentially lowball the compensation even in those cases of direct physical occupation. Is there time for one more question or two more questions? I'm willing to stay as long as the plane stays, Mark. Yep. Uh, I have a question about the latest uh, chapter in the uh, Commerce Clause saga. Okay. And this is the Raish case, which I'm sure you know where yeah, I'm I going. I wrote a brief in that one, yeah. Yeah, and uh, the, the, the question is, uh, I assume from the, well, first apply your model to Raish. I assume you, you would apply the strict scrutiny because this is government action yeah. as a regulator. Um, but then secondly, what do you think of Scalia's uh, concurrence, his alternative test of necessary and proper that would be substituting for the substantial effects test? And, 
you know, obviously he, he went ahead and condoned the, uh, or found the, the power to be within, the, the, the exercise of power to be within Congress's constitutional prerogatives. But do you think his test actually could be good if he had applied it more rigorously? Yeah. All right, let me give you the explanation that I would give to these cases. First of all, this is law professor's shorthand, and let me explain to the non-lawyers what this case is about. Uh, and this is an issue of great concern to a lot of college students. It has to do with the use of marijuana as being licensed under state law. And there is at the federal law something known as the Controlled Substances Act, which is extremely tough in terms of the legal penalties that are attached to the use and possession of marijuana. And it's the statute on which most of our drug enforcement activities rest. And there is no question under the modern view of the Commerce Clause, you can apply that not only to the shipment of drugs across state lines, even though they're innocuous when they're on the airplane, and it also applies to their consumption when they're received, or to the willingness to grow these things for domestic consumption, and in fact, the domestic consumption by the person who grows it without the benefit of a commercial transaction. It is perfectly well settled, quote unquote, that all of these things are in interstate commerce, and I regard the decisions as essentially verbal absurdities, but it's too late, I think, in principle, to do much about that. The medical marijuana cases involve a different problem, because many states, 11 in fact, have decided to adopt programs in which they will administer in various ways marijuana to individuals who in fact have medical testimony that their conditions are so severe and their pain so unyielding, just take that as one version of the test, uh, that it cannot be cured by any medical means known. And one of the things that we do know, although the government officials denied it, is that this weird concoction of weed, which when you burn it creates all sorts of funny byproducts, often works much more effectively in people as by their own subjective reports than the use of various kinds of marijuana or extracts that it could sell in either pills or in liquids, the most common of them being something known as marisol. And so what happened in the Rice case is you had somebody, two people in fact, Reich and Morrison, who had horrific medical conditions, strong doctor's testimony that they received some relief from suicidally serious pain was the way in which they described it, okay? By using this stuff, and then the federal government says, hey, you can't do this because even the home consumption and use of marijuana is caught by the old rule which says if you can't feed grain to your cows and stay out of inside in interstate commerce, you can't feed marijuana to yourself and find this as quote unquote a local transaction. Now what Justice Scalia was thinking about was the following question. Could you, and I'm going to put it in words better than his, I'd like to think, is can you figure out a way that you could quarantine this local transaction such that you are confident that the marijuana which is consumed in these particular cases does not bleed into the general scope of the Commerce Clause? And the argument against the California program in particular is it was run with notorious laxity. It's not as though everybody who was eligible under that program had the conditions of Ms. Reich and Ms. Morrison. Some of these people went there, presented a doctor's certificate, and then smoked up their pot and shared it with their friends, and so essentially became a legal supply for uses that went outside the medical program. The way I think you would want to reconcile this if you use the necessary and proper language of Justice Scalia is to say as follows, and this is where the difference is. You go back to California and say, look, if in fact you quarantine under his test the marijuana so it doesn't seep into interstate commerce, then what we will conclude under these circumstances is that it doesn't influence the flow and you can do it. But you have to prove that. So we're not going to prejudge this particular program and if it's a sloppy program we'll strike it down on the grounds that it doesn't meet the test and then you, the state of California, could make it a lot tougher so that it does meet this test. And so the theory of necessary and proper means, in effect, if this program is quarantined, it is no longer necessary to prevent the medical use which is authorized by state law in order to keep interstate commerce cleansed of this stuff, and it's no longer proper for it to do so because there's a legitimate state interest in taking care of the health of its citizens by allowing them access to medical goods. And when I wrote my brief, that was the line that we essentially took in this particular case. Um, we urged them to overrule Wicked and Filburn. We knew where that was going to go. And then what we said is, don't worry about that if you don't want to. Uh, but given the fact that this decision has such really precarious legitimacy, this is what you ought to do. And what Scalia did 
is he announced a test that was marginally tougher, and then he applied it in a lackadaisical fashion, so as to essentially line him up with the majority. And this is a case, don't judge by what he says, judge by what he does, and if he's willing to allow that to go through, that means, in effect, that he has just erected a, a set of false hopes and aspirations, but hasn't done anything different. Uh, this case is fundamentally different from Wickard and Filburn, the grain case in one sense. When you're dealing with grain, every local farmer wishes to have a cartel. They're all going to support it. So there's no countervailing state and local interest. But in the medical marijuana cases, there's some people who really want to use this stuff, and they would be strongly opposed to any system that restricts it on grounds of medical privacy and the like. And so therefore, the state interest here is much stronger in terms of opposing the federal interest than it is in some of these grain cases. We pushed that argument, but again, it didn't have any success because the Supreme Court, as currently aligned, says if you don't like something, go to the FDA. You could go to the FDA, and in the year 2525, you might be able to get smoked marijuana approved, but I can guarantee you, having done a lot of work recently on medical stuff going through the FDA, you're never going to be able to approve anything that you have to burn because you cannot identify all the precise chemical elements in the flame, and so therefore they don't have no way of giving under their current rules any kind of approval process. I mean, it's just not going to happen unless you blow the FDA up and start over again, which may be a noble endeavor, but that's not going to happen in the right case. Time for one more question, and then we'll go home. Okay, yes, sir? I don't approve. Uh, <laughs> Signing statements. These are known as legislative signing statements. I actually did write a piece on this in the um, Chicago Tribune about four months ago. So I have been on a silent, limited government campaign, which political situation is whatever George Bush wants in the name of executive power is incorrect. Um, so again, this is, I'm not your standard Republican speech. This is the way in which I think separation of powers works. It says in effect that the two parties have to play by a set of rules which they cannot vary either unilaterally or collectively. And the reason is that long-term structural protections will always be eliminated if, for example, at the beginning of every section, the President and the Congress get together and they pass a bill which says for the next four years, a presidential veto can, only, can be overridden only by 75% of the votes or by 60% of the votes. I don't care what direction. You just have these permanent rules. What the veto is, by definition, is an all-or-nothing proposition. What they're telling the President is you've got to put up or shut up. Now, there's some people who think that maybe that isn't such a good idea, and perhaps we ought to allow line item vetoes, although there's serious questions as to whether those things would be constitutional, given the way in which the veto power is structured in the Constitution. But the one thing that is perfectly clear is that a signing statement which says, hey, I'm going to pass this bill, but I want you to know that Section 2A may not mean what the Congress says it means, is wholly illegitimate. The proper way, therefore, to treat this stuff is as follows. If anyone's looked at legislative history, they will know that it is largely garbage. That what happens is after the bill is passed, some people will put together some platitudes to explain what it meant, but that oftentimes the political agenda is rather different. And so Justice Scalia, for example, has rightly, in my view, said you've got to be very careful about legislative history, particularly when it contravenes explicit text, because one is authoritative and voted upon, and the other is subject to amendments after the bill is passed um, by a few select senators. I take the same attitude towards the executive signing statement. The president may be exactly right that it turns out that Pfizer is unconstitutional because of X. Once he signs the bill, the proper procedure is not to say, I'm not going to enforce it as such. He's got to get himself some judicial approval for saying that it's unconstitutional insofar as it applies in the way he does it. And then he could make those arguments to a court, and if he wins, he wins. If he loses, he loses. The real danger you get with executive <coughs> signing statements is that he's going to order everybody in the administration to follow his view of what the bill is rather than the bill itself. And that creates this nightmare vision where each branch of government has a different constitutional or legislative text by which they work. And so I think, in effect, the appropriate legal remedy is once any citizen, any citizen in my view, is aware of the fact that the president has made orders which essentially excise certain portions of the bill, they should be able to go into court in order to enjoin this activities on the ground that is ultra-virus, that is beyond the powers of the president. He then defends on the merits. If he wins, he wins. If he loses, he loses. 
This, unfortunately, under American law, is extremely difficult to do. We have a general rule which has no textual warrant and no structural warrant, which says you have to prove that there is standing, a particular interest that you have above and beyond that shared by other citizens before you could attack any legislation. That means, in effect, ordinary citizens cannot attack it, which means, in effect, that you've got to wait until somebody's arrested under a version of the bill that the president believes in but the Congress does not in order to challenge it, and I think that's waiting too long. I'm a very strong believer in facial challenges to constitutional texts uh, by any citizen. I think that so long as one guy wants to support a statute and the other guy wants to oppose that statute, you have a case in controversy. That has always been the rule with respect to ultraviaries by, by municipal governments, and only a Supreme Court decision in the 1920s reversed it, where the efforts at distinction were, to put it mildly, futile and fatuous. So it's a case called Frothingham against Mellon. So I think I think these are very serious kinds of issues that we have. And I'm a strong believer in structural protections under the Constitution. And I don't care whether the President is forcing a version of the bill that I personally prefer to the one that Congress passed. It's just utterly immaterial. I think that you cannot allow unilateral decisions by any branch of government to deflect from the course of orderly passage of legislation that is stipulated and outlined in the Constitution. Okay? I think we probably should call it a day, don't you? Okay, thank you again. We went longer than we thought. Huh? That's terrific. Okay.